Comp Review Assignment 3. Let's begin. This was a nice mix of vocabulary, so hopefully this helped you guys to recall some material from the beginning of the year. The study of the oceans and oceanic phenomena would be an oceanographer. Anything to do with the ocean, start thinking oceanographer. The study of the atmosphere and atmospheric phenomena, weather and climate, we did several chapters on meteorology. The study of the universe would be astronomy. Evaluation of scientific work by others working in the same field to determine validity is peer review. Asking your peers, others that are working in that field, to look at your stuff. Peer review. Too easy. Water portion of our planet is the hydrosphere. Remember that the hydrosphere can be the oceans, lakes, rivers, even glacial ice, all part of the hydrosphere. Then remember that with the hydrosphere, we have 97% of Earth's water in the ocean. 3% is then the fresh water. Of that 3%, the majority is glacial ice. But of course, we know that's changing because the glaciers are melting, right? All right. The gaseous portion of our planet, or the gaseous envelope that surrounds our planet, that would be the atmosphere, the totality of life on Earth. Stop right there. Life on Earth, don't want to read any more. Biosphere. And then the solid Earth, of course, is the geosphere. Great, on to a little bit of chemistry. Neutrons are subatomic particles found in the nucleus of atoms. They have a neutral charge. What you'd also find in the nucleus would be a proton. Surrounding the nucleus are going to be the uh, negatively charged electrons. Good. Which following is not a property of minerals. So that would be man-made because we know the five properties for minerals would be naturally occurring, inorganic, definite crystalline structure, solid, and a definite chemical formula. Good. The study of minerals is called mineralogy, a substance that cannot be decomposed into simpler substance by ordinary means. Right? We can't break it down into a simpler substance by ordinary means. It's actually an element. Probably a good point to admit that I've used someone's work that looked pretty good, but I'll make some corrections as we're going along. Mineral identification properties include which of the following? And that would have to be luster and hardness. We don't care about the temperature or pressure. We don't care about the weight and the size. We don't care so much about the taste or smell. Please don't go around sniffing and licking rocks or minerals, all right? Um, other properties would also include specific gravity, regular density. Remember that specific gravity is when you take the density of the mineral and then you just drop the units. So you, if you had 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed, it would just be 2.7 as the specific gravity. Um, you could also, and I said this cautiously, use color, but that should be your third or fourth step toward identification. Also, streak. These are all great identification properties. All right, a little fill-in. The rock cycle. Remember, the rock cycle was proposed by James Hutton, and it really goes through how the, any rock can become any other rock. So it illustrates the origin of the three basic rock types and the role of geologic processes in transforming one rock type into another. So remember, an igneous rock can become a sedimentary rock, a metamorphic rock, or even, if it melts, it can become an igneous rock again. All right, a metal-rich accumulation of mineral matter that occurs along a fracture or bedding plane is called a vein deposit. We mentioned it very lightly. I wouldn't stress that one. Cementation and compaction, another word you could use there is sedimentation or lithification. These are all good words. Refer to the process by which sediments are transformed into solid sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rocks, when subjected to great pressure and heat, will turn into 
the rock type metamorphic. Remember, heat and pressure, key words there, heat and pressure, you're going to get metamorphism. Magma is molten material found inside the Earth. When you put that molten material on Earth's surface, we call it lava. We'll get to that in a second. Fine-grained igneous rocks that contain voids left by gas bubbles. That right there is really important. Voids left by gas bubbles. We call those vesicles. So, as the lava solidifies, are said to exhibit a vesicular texture. A vesicular texture. If they're little voids, the two rocks, by the way, would be scoria, if it's mafic, and pumice, if it's felsic. Scoria and pumice. Metamorphic rocks that have formed in response to large-scale mountain building processes are said to have undergone regional metamorphism. Regional metamorphism. The rock type that forms when sediment is lithified is sedimentary rock. Magma that reaches Earth's surface is called lava. Can I get it too easy? Which of the following processes contributes to the breakdown of rock material? The breakdown of rock material would be weathering. So there you go, weathering, and I'm correct in this work as we go. I want to emphasize, though, that erosion and mass wasting are how you're going to transport this material. Mass wasting because of gravity and erosion because of wind, water, or ice. Weathering involves the mechanical and chemical breakup of rock. Remember, mechanical weathering means you're going to break it into smaller pieces without changing its composition. If you're changing composition, then it's chemical weathering. Hopefully you picked up on what I'm trying to emphasize there. Which of the following causes mass movements or mass wasting? That would be gravity. Gravity is going to cause the rock fall, the slump, the creep, the landslide, the earth flow. All these different examples of mass wasting all under the force of gravity. The energy from external processes comes primarily from the sun. External processes from the sun. The radioactive decay of elements would be where you'd get geothermal energy or energy inside the earth. Moving on. When liquid water freezes, its volume expands or increases by 9%. If you said 9 or 10%, you're good to go. Remember that that expansion, because of the freezing, is what's going to cause the mechanical weathering called frost wedging. It's also going to cause glacial plucking. If I'm using words that you're not comfortable with, go look them up, please. How do chemical weathering processes differ from mechanical weathering processes? Chemical weathering processes change the composition of rocks, but mechanical weathering processes do not. Again, chemical changes composition. On to a little Alfred Wegener. The hypothesis that originally proposed that the continents are rafted about is continental drift. B. A boundary in which two plates move together move together is a convergent plate boundary. Remember your two types of convergent plate boundaries will be collision boundary if it's continental to continental lithospheric plate and subduction if it's oceanic to anything else. And let's remember that with the oceanic plate if you have two oceanic the older, denser, cooler oceanic plate will subduct. That's also why you can't find oceanic crust that's older than 180 million years old, because it keeps subducting, it keeps recycling itself. But with the collision boundary, two continental plates just suture together. They just more together in what we call an orogeny, a mountain building event, and you maintain that continent. You're relying on 
um, weathering and erosion to wear that down. The rigid outer layer of earth, including the crust and upper mantle, would be lithosphere. The theory that proposes that Earth's outer shell consists of individual plates, I'm going to pause there, seven major and another dozen minor plates that interact in various ways and thereby produce earthquakes, volcanoes, mountains, and the crust itself. That's plate tectonics, folks. Plate tectonics in a nutshell. The proposed supercontinent that 200 million years ago began to break apart and form the present landmass. That's going to be Pangaea. Remember, all the continents were sutured together. Um, the U.S. was actually, or North America was actually sitting down over the equator at that time, and then it started to break up. That's actually where we got the Atlantic Ocean from. Good. A region where the rigid plates are moving apart to move apart is to separate or to diverge, so divergent boundary. Um, the major divergent boundary that we talked about was the mid-ocean ridge. In the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you got that mid-ocean ridge system. Um, the mechanism there would be ridge push that's pushing them apart. Make sure you guys are understanding these ideas. They will be important. Strong evidence that two continents were once joined might include similarities in similar coastal rock formations. Remember that the Appalachian mountain chain that goes from Georgia all the way up to Maine would link up very nicely with the Caledonian Mountains in northern Europe. So put the, get rid of the Atlantic Ocean, put it back together like a puzzle piece, and boom, you'll see where those mountains line up. Go back and check your notes if you don't know what I'm talking about. Conan continental drift was not accepted primarily because Wegener lacked a mechanism for plate movement. He couldn't, he got plenty of evidence, right? The, the puzzle pieces worked. Um, he had the Mesosaurus that he found in South America and Africa that the continents had to be together in order for it to make sense. He also had the Glossopteris, the fern seed that was distributed. Again, he, he had plenty of evidence. But without a viable mechanism, he didn't get very far. Which statement best describes Earth's lithospheric plates? It can be rigid and moves about on the asthenosphere. Let's recall that the, that the asthenosphere is the ductile upper mantle. Ductile-like hot cheese, right? It's not solid, not liquid, it's ductile. What type of evidence did Wegener use to support his theory? He had fossil evidence, the Glossopteris and the Mesosaurus. He had the rock formations, again, the Appalachian Mountains and the Caledonian lined up. And he had the shapes of the continents that looked like they'd fit together like puzzle pieces. Therefore, it had to be D, all of the above might be a good point to review that his puzzle piece idea didn't work out perfectly because there were some gaps because he didn't know about the continental shelf. We don't get the continental shelf until Maria Tharp makes the map of the ocean floor, publishes that, and then um, they actually look and say, wait, if we use the continental shelf as our puzzle piece, everything locks right up. It's quite impressive. All right. Happy studying.